Great, well, uh, good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, press conference before the start of our 26th World Economic Forum on ASEAN. My name is Justin Wood. I look after the Asia Pacific region at the forum. Um, and the purpose of this press conference is to introduce you to the six co-chairs of our summit um, and to hear from them about some of the uh, big ideas, uh, the priorities um, for the summit and their hopes and aspirations about how uh, this meeting can make some progress in uh, pushing forward on all of these, these ideas and these priorities. Um, I'll introduce uh, the six co-chairs to you um, very briefly. Uh, I'll do it um, moving from my left along the line. Um, we have uh, Tantri uh, Jamal from uh, Axiata, who is the uh, Managing Director, President and Group CEO. Axiata, of course, um, a telecoms company. Then we have uh, Dr. Wolfgang um, Yaman, who is the CEO and Secretary General of Care International. Um, it's an NGO focused on alleviating poverty, has activities across all the ASEAN region and especially here um, in Cambodia. Then we have uh, Jin Li Chun, who is the president of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, a very new multilateral uh, development organization. Um, then we have John Rice um, from GE, a uh, uh, US um, multinational uh, conglomerate in many, many different sectors. Uh, John's based in Hong Kong. Um, and then we have uh, Tan Hui Ling, the co-founder of Grab, uh, Grab based in Singapore. It's a uh, ride hailing service, uh, example of a new economy company. And then finally, we have uh, Kuntevin Vongvanic from uh, PTT, um, a Thai company. Uh, Kuntevin is CEO, it's in the oil and gas sector. So a wide range of, of uh, different sectors and priorities and interests, um, but all passionate about Southeast Asia and the development and progress uh, of this region. So I'm going to hand over to each of them in turn. Um, they'll have three or four minutes to share their aspirations, their hopes for this summit, their priorities for the region, and then with whatever time we have left, um, we'll have an opportunity for you uh, to ask some questions of them. So, uh, Tan Sri Jamal, let me start with you. I was hoping I'm the last. <laughs> well, for one thing, you know, <clears throat> we are quite natural for us to be here. We, we operate uh, in 10 countries, uh, in ASEAN and South Asia, and Cambodia is one of our, uh, it's not the biggest, but definitely among the fastest growing uh, operation uh, among within the group. And, um, and it's also, uh, quite a, one of the largest uh, telcos and arguably maybe the largest uh, and also one of the largest companies in the whole of the country. So kind of natural for us to be here and given our presence, is a strong presence in ASEAN, one of the largest companies in ASEAN. Um, I guess the what we have been uh, kind of advocating for the last, uh, not recently, for the last one year or so, is the concept of how the digital revolution or how can ASEAN leapfrog into the the big game of digital and internet uh, and broadband uh, and create, in fact, we've done a study to create an additional one trillion increase in GDP by 2026. That's the kind of uh, advocacy that we are going after. And we would like to get the concept of um, digital leapfrog to be as a national agenda of all the countries in ASEAN. It's not a telecom or telecom ministry agenda, it should be a national agenda. And we think that ASEAN is the right sweet spot to kind of leapfrog uh, many countries in the world or many uh, regions in the world to be in the forefront of this uh, digital revolution. We, in, in some sense we are ahead, in, some, in many sense we are quite behind, um, but we need to leapfrog and we have every opportunity to do that. And it takes uh, changes in policies of the government, um, especially with regards to the telecom industry, the, the spectrum issue, the question of uh, uh, financial re re regulation with, regard, with regards to financial regulation or for uh, fintech and so on and so forth. So I'm here uh, because I naturally should be here, but also because I'm advocating this one trillion GDP delta growth for the region. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Yaman. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Very glad to be invited um, and uh, quite thankful to the World Economic Forum that uh, you give those opportunities to 
civil society leaders uh, to co-chair regional and annual summits. Uh, I think it's, it's a great commitment. We take this as a serious commitment to partnership around your ambition, which you see in every WEF's publication, which is committed to improve the state of the world. So uh, the commitment to such partnerships is quite exciting. Um, they're supposed to be constructive, uh, but they also have a bit of a dimension of challenging one another. So uh, civil society does speak about uncomfortable issues uh, like inequality, like shrinking civic space or human rights. And we do this on behalf of um, many simple people and communities, um, which are often at the risk of being left behind when there's particularly so great development opportunities. So my organization works in 95 countries around the world, in almost all ASEAN countries. And we particularly focus on the situation of women and girls. And the theme of our conference has such a particular relevance to them um, so that we're actually quite excited to be part of the discussion. Our programs that work with boys and girls in, um, in the region here do include training in digital and technological capabilities. We try, this, um, to, uh, we try to develop this as a means of resilience to a changing world and to address gender inequalities. So frankly, we do have a problem. Um, worldwide, only one quarter of women do work in ICT or in computer and mathematical sciences. And in our host country here in Cambodia, 94% of doctoral students are male and only 20, 21% of researchers are female. So if this is left untouched, all these burgeoning technological advancements run the risk of even increasing gender inequality. But we need to ensure equality now if growth, growth is supposed to be truly inclusive. And the fourth industrial revolution that we're in the middle of um, has these unprecedented opportunities um, to address inequalities that have not been addressed by previous revolutions. Research has shown, this is a McKinsey study, that if we advance gender equality now, as much as 12 trillion US dollars could be added to the global economy by 2025. So closing the gender gap is not just a question of equality and fairness, it's also about good economics. So allow me to uh, focus on feminism, which is not a fad. It is where huge potential economic gains, gains become unlocked. And we have to talk about um, inclusive growth by prioritizing and promoting girls in the digital skill force today to reap greater dividends tomorrow. So we are working with local communities and we're trying to bring them into, into what's happening in terms of those rapid developments. And I encourage all participants of this conference to take the opportunity to engage with civil society representatives, which are many, and seek the opportunities that come from our connectedness to the communities and the perspectives they bring. We have seen in many parts of the world how fragile societies and business environments can become if we do not address those questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's move on and hear from President Jin at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is a multilateral development institution which has now about 70, 70 countries. And by the end of this year, we will have uh, about 85 <coughs> member countries from across the whole world. The mission of this bank is to promote a broad-based economic social development through investment in infrastructure. And we believe that uh, infrastructure is very important for the emerging market economies in their efforts to move to the upper middle income countries and improving the livelihood of the people. And a poverty reduction would be the logical and natural outcome of the broad-based economic social development. ASEAN countries are the first group of countries which participated in the setting up of this bank. And we attach great importance to the connectivity in ASEAN and between ASEAN and other neighboring countries. We believe that uh, our efforts to promote investment in infrastructure and other productive sectors will create great opportunities 
particularly for the young people in Cambodia and this region. And I think uh, we work, uh, our efforts to work very closely with the private sector can help the government to release resources to focus on social sector, on environmental protection, on some other kind of, you know, very important uh, areas. That is the very good, uh, I think, division of responsibility between the government uh, and uh, the private sector. So we want to do something uh, in this area, and we are having great cooperation with the World Bank ADB. We are looking forward to be working in this region. I thank you very much. Thank you, President Jin. Uh, uh, John Rice, the uh, priorities and perspectives from uh, GE. <laughs> Well, thank you, and, and let me also add my thanks to the World Economic Forum for, for choosing Cambodia uh, to, as the, the, the host of the meeting. I think that's a reflection of this country's great progress over the last 30 years with, with, with more to come, right? There's still challenges and opportunities, and I think we, we all recognize that. Uh, the, the market size, ASEAN market size, speaks for itself almost 700 million people, a growing middle class, markets that have grown uh, on average over 5% over the last 15 years. So for a company like ours that's involved in, in basic infrastructure technologies, you know, there's no place like home. And we think of the ASEAN region as our home. We've been in some of these countries for almost 100 years. So we're, so we're not new. But the other thing I'd, I'd point out is the interdependencies in the region. I mean, this is an, an enormous, important trading block by itself. <clears throat> we have about 9,000 employees in the region, and we manufacture things, we service things, we do lots of different activities with these employees. 75% uh, of what we do in, in, on average in a country goes someplace else. So these, you know, we try to build export competitive activities so that, so that the markets by themselves don't have to support the business. The export opportunities will help support the business. Uh, the basic infrastructure needs are clear. Some 15% of the population lacks basic access to affordable electricity and it's very difficult to solve the disparity issues that we talked about a few minutes ago without solving that problem. So, so we think about infrastructure uh, as a, a hierarchy almost, and at the very bottom of the triangle, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of social needs, you have basic things like electricity, clean water, health care. Without that, you know, this idea of sustainable economic growth that, that, that brings everybody along with it is very, very difficult to achieve. Underpinning that, you, you have two things. You have human capital and financial capital. And President Jin is well equipped to, to, to talk about the financial capital and the, the formation of the AIIB, I believe, was important and right and another way to focus on these, on these basic needs. Uh, so in the end, a company like ours, we look at the region, we look at Cambodia as, 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 as one of our homes around the world, and it's critically important for us to be, to be both a U.S. company, a global company, and a very local company in every ASEAN country, depending on what the circumstances require. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, uh, Hui Lin, um, one of the region's newest uh, companies in, the, in, a, in a very uh, emerging sector, your, your hopes and aspirations. Firstly, I would like to say thank you. Very humbled to be on this panel with such distinguished leaders from across the region and the world. So, Grab, we, f we feel responsible for ASEAN. Uh, when we first started the company, my co-founder and I, <coughs> everything that we wanted to do actually completely aligns with the objectives of this summit. Whether it's around bringing ASEAN together, using technology to leapfrog, uh, leapfrog thinking about ways how the young generation, more than 50% of ASEAN is less than 30 years old, right? How do we bring all of those opportunities together to shape the future of ASEAN? We've done it via you know, our way, 
of launching Grab Mobile, becoming the dominant transport uh, platform in Southeast Asia. But we also know that we can't do this alone. Um, my objectives and our shared objectives at Grab is to be here and listen, learn, see how we can help, um, and also share some of the things that we believe can be changed to accelerate this growth. Uh, because ultimately, I don't think I've heard anybody say anything that's not aligned with ASEAN is in a beautiful spot right now. It's, it's untapped, there's tremendous opportunities, and it's in our hands to shape. So ultimately, that's what we'd like to do, uh, and we're here to support in what way we can. Thank you, Huiling. And uh, finally, uh, Kun Tevin at uh, PTT. Thank you, Justin. And uh, I also like to thank the BBF for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to participate in this forum. Uh, as in, as uh, many uh, speakers already mentioned, it's growing and uh, big market size. Uh, I think probably on the top five of the largest market uh, community in, in the world, especially in the region, is top three. Uh, energy uh, is my area and energy is required as an enabler for development of the uh, economy. So, uh, uh, and energy has few challenges. Uh, as an enabler, we need to look into the, the ways and means to provide sufficient energy to all the different countries. And of course, among the ASEANs, we have already developed country, we have developing, and we have the coming uh, emerging countries as well. So uh, to look into the infrastructure, to look into the cooperation among the ASEAN members, which can help each other, would be something which is of a, a great benefit to the uh, growth of ASEAN. Uh, the other aspect of energy is the energy transition. We're in the mode of uh, looking into the future and maybe changing the way how people use energy from fossil fuel to renewables, uh, from the internal combustion engine into EVs. And those are the things that if the ASEAN members are working together and working together also with the, uh, with the nations outside of ASEAN, I think it will be for the, the best uh, benefit uh, for ASEAN. And so I'm, I'm here to, uh, to listen, to learn, and also to maybe campaign a little bit about the connectivity in energy sector. And for the connectivity maybe to, to large uh, scheme. One is the physical connectivity, which means uh, the connectivity of molecules, of, of electrons that would be interchanging, interconnecting between the ASEAN countries. And the, the other area is the uh, virtual connectivity, meaning that we can optimize our investment in infrastructure, sharing uh, all some of the infrastructure that uh, each of our countries are, are building, and so we can maximize the utilization of our infrastructure as well as the funding requirements. Uh, ASEAN has one organization which has been set up for I think over 30 years which is called ASCO, the ASEAN Cooperation on Petroleum uh, comprising of the 10 uh, national oil companies and we are currently talking about this uh, project of connectivities on both areas. Uh, so in part I would like just to advertise a little bit for ASCO so that people would know and get ASCO to get involved in the activity of the BWF in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you've heard from all the co-chairs um, and their priorities and their hopes. Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, are there any questions that any of you would like to put to any of our co-chairs? Uh, please. And uh, before you ask a question, if you could state your name and the organization that you represent. Thank you. Uh, this is Yasu Oto with Nick K, uh, which is happening in this video. Uh, President Jin, uh, we keep hearing that uh, lately you see Mr. Nakao of ADB uh, quite frequently. And I'm just wondering if uh, what is the nature of the relationship with ADB? It's been uh, told that uh, AIIB and ADB was uh, interpreted as in a rivalry relation in the past, but uh, how does it develop now? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, President Nakao and I have been friends for more than decades. And uh, as you know, uh, we not just personally uh, have this friendship, but also we share the common objective of promoting 
and economic and social development in this region. Uh, we met 10 times, and recently I met him in Yokohama's 50th anniversary of the ADB. And as you know, I served five years as the vice president of ADB, working for the Mekong subregion and other areas in Asia. Uh, it is certainly uh, not, uh, certainly a kind of misconception that the creation of this new bank is to uh, create a rival against uh, ADB or the World Bank. Uh, Japan set up this bank uh, with the support of so many countries more than 50 years ago at a time when Asian economic size was still very much uh, limited. And the living standard and the per capita income in most of these countries in Asia were very low. Now, 50 years later, the size of the uh, Asian economy is much, much bigger. And uh, the demand for infrastructure investment and other productive sectors is huge. So it may not be possible for one or two institutions to meet the needs of these regions. And furthermore, uh, we share uh, the common objective of promoting infrastructure, but ADB has softer window. ADB promotes social sectors, health, education, poverty reduction. We don't have the softer funding. We focus only on infrastructure and other productive sectors. So there's cooperation, but also division of responsibility. So we enjoyed a very good cooperation with ADB, World Bank, and also EBRB and some other institutions. So people would understand how wonderful it is for us, this group of AMDB's multilateral development institutions to work together for the common objective, but with division of responsibility. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? Um, yes, over here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kamaro from Astro One in Malaysia. One for Tanshree and one for Huilin and of course AIIB. It's all focusing on the digital leapfrog that Tanshree mentioned before. The number is nice, it's one trillion US dollars. But the gaps of poverty and the broadband digital gap, for example, even in Malaysia, your home country, mm -hmm. in Borneo, for example, why can't ASEAN countries work on specific singular projects? Like the island of Borneo has three ASEAN states, for example. The question for AIIB is how much is going to be the focus on digital broadband infrastructure for this leapfrog to happen? And uh, to add in to Grab and Huilin, since you're the youngest in front here, and you're the new economy captain, still unemployment among youth is high. And uh, if you look at it, how would digital opportunities not just give those who are good in programming and coding and maths and computer, but also help the current traditional economy to migrate higher to a digital base. So that's my question, thank you. Let me start. The, uh, when we talk about the uh, economic uh, digital, I call it digital leapfrog, uh, it, it involves not just infrastructure that will benefit a uh, few, it should have a connectivity all the way to rural areas. You're right, in a, even in Malaysia, uh, connectivity has not reached, uh, the basic connectivity has reached 99% of the population but the broadband connectivity is still lagging. Precisely, you know, I think uh, it requires a lot of both the uh, public sector and the private sector to work together to, to make it happen. And that's the ecosystem that I was talking about you want to build the, uh, between the, the broadband infrastructure, the financial incentives, the funding of the plan, and, and the, uh, the fan funding of the whole thing, and all of the necessities to make it uh, a big ecosystem. One of the offshoot of the uh, broadband uh, revolution or the digital fraud is the financial inclusion. And one of the things we want to do is to be able to reach the, uh, maybe Malaysia less of a case, but still uh, quite important, uh, the, what we call financial inclusion on connectivity in terms of uh, getting people for unbanked customers or underserved customers, and to some extent more of a convenience, right? Now that's more applicable to perhaps more uh, in the cases like Indonesia and many other countries, but still it helps uh, when you talk about poverty to get even people uh, in the poverty level to be able to uh, be part of that digital revolution. And, and the financial inclusion, like I say, is just one of the many things, but perhaps one of the biggest things that affect their life uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, livelihood. 
uh, your, your last point whether Austrian can work together obviously we can and we should uh, and there's a lot of things we can learn from each other perhaps the, the whole uh, broadband community across the, 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 the ASEAN region the connectivity from one country to another and of course one of the most favorite topics has been the roaming data roaming and I think eventually there, should no, there shouldn't be anything called roaming should be the, the world for the past uh, but it takes some time for it to be involved uh, and also the, the, the market the, the should be open to all ASEAN countries and uh, example the grab or new digital economics should be very open to all countries within ASEAN and so on so we, we have a lot of work to do but it requires tremendous amount of work and uh, priority that, that's why I, I keep saying it gotta be a national agenda it's not a telecom agenda it's a national agenda that will hit every single uh, people in the society um, President Jin, your... Uh... It, you know, it, it's very much interesting to note that uh, uh, all sectors are related in this world. A digital economy is certainly important in this, uh, in the, in, in this present world, but we should understand that uh, uh, digital uh, e economy as a form of new economy can only work through the traditional economies. It cannot stand on its own without the corresponding development of other areas. Uh, digital economy, in my, uh, and to my understanding, is to improve the efficiency and uh, cost effectiveness in doing business. So when we build power plants, the power generation and transmission certainly helps. But when we build roads, railways, ports, airports, seaports, and all these kind of sectors, digital economy permeates, permeates all these sectors. So even if we do not directly in invest in digital uh, sector, we are helping with it. And also, I believe private sector is the best partner for digital economy. Thank you. Really? President Jin, I'm so happy you brought that up because mm. as I think about what examples companies like Grab or other companies can help via dig digitization, you're completely right. Grab did not involve uh, we did not invent transportation. What we did was we applied technology, mobile technology, thinking about it differently to make it much more efficient than it was before, to help it leapfrog from street hailing, from the radio, to something that was way more efficient via data and infrastructure. So as I think about your question, let me use Grab as an example. Uh, how can we help with unemployment? That was exactly the problem set that Anthony and I, myself, my co-founder and myself, set for ourselves. To date, what we have done is we currently have more than 850,000 drivers on Grab throughout Southeast Asia. And these are all drivers who can decide when, where they want to work, and if they want to at all. We have part-time drivers, full-time drivers, and we have drivers who are from all generations, whether it's young or older. Why I use this as an example is because I believe technology is not for any particular generation. We need to think about it in segmented, tailored ways. And we need to understand that when we are thinking of building the next form of economy, we need to take everyone along with us. And we need to understand what the changes and shifts and dimensions are. And augment for it. Let me give an example of what we're doing as well, um, just because that's the industry and the company I know best. Grab, now that we have been able to solidify a strong working business model that brings inclusiveness for our drivers, it brings safety, accessibility, and convenience for our passengers, what we're trying to do now is take the same principles and apply it to payments, the financial services industry. There's a ton of opportunity there again. I'm, I'm not going to talk about Grab, but I want, want us to think about this as a mindset. Uh, when we started the company, we were very, very clear that we did not want a single bottom line. We would not have started a company otherwise. I think about it as a Venn diagram of three Ps. People, the people we're serving, the grabbers that we're serving, the partners that we're serving. The other P, which is critical for it to be sustainable, is profit. 
It needs to be a sustainable business model. And the third P is the planet. Why we're doing this with transportation and, and payments is because it's the only scalable way for us to continue growing as a human race while being sustainable without destroying Earth, Mother Earth as is. So those are some of the things as I think about. Um, it's worked for us at Grab. We would like to encourage other companies to think about it, old and new. Um, I think stereotypes don't help any of us at this point in time. I would urge all of us to think that that potential and opportunity is possible and that we need to do this together because Grab would not be here today were it not for the support that we've gotten, whether from public governments, private funding institutions, global, regional, local, uh, our customers, everyone here, the media as well. So let's think about every single conversation that we have, what we can do to help each other get to the next stage. Um, thank you very much, Hui Ling. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, it's very nice to have ended on an impassioned plea for multi-stakeholder cooperation, which of course is what the World Economic Forum is all about. Um, we could continue this conversation, and it will be fascinating for, for many more hours, I'm sure, but hopefully you'll get to hear from our co-chairs in their sessions over the next two days, um, and many others as well. Um, but unfortunately, now uh, some of our panelists have to, some of our coaches have to get to other sessions. So I'm going to draw this to a close. Thank you very much, and thank you, co-chairs, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.